Tonight, over the past week, we've shown you the massive wave of Muslim migration that's changing the culture of Europe. In this, our final episode, we'll introduce you to the political dissidents fighting back in parliaments, in the media, and even in churches and synagogues. It's March 8th, and you're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon yeah. consumer I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government for why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. We went to Europe with a video camera and a mission to see for ourselves what the Million Muslim March through a post-Christian continent looks like. What happens when you open up your borders to anyone, unlimited, unrestricted, unvetted, first come, first served, survival of the fittest, the opposite of Western concepts of refugees, being women and children first, these are 75% young men, according to the United Nations, military-age men, walking over borders unopposed. Anyone who wants to come for any reason or no reason, some real refugees from war for sure, we met some of those, but mainly opportunists, some seeking the opportunity to work, but many seeking the opportunity to not work, but to be paid European welfare state levels of free housing, free health care, and free everything else. Remember this guy, a Somali migrant? He said he shopped around looking for the European country that offered the most free stuff. That's why he came to Malmo, Sweden, not to work, not to flee, but for the massive free house and welfare that his wife and five children got while he lived his life in another country. Secondly, Sweden, because in, in Sweden, in, there is big house, homes, about whom? In, if you are alone, you get in two room, three room, like that. But the other you you cannot get. I live before in 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 Denmark, Germany, Austria, in Switzerland. But you cannot get good in good house, good home. At least that man has a family and the moderating effects that could bring. But according to the United Nations, three quarters of these Muslim migrants are young single men. They're military age and they bring with them what unbridled, ungoverned, ungovernable young men always do. Crime, violence and rape. And in this case, a rape culture that says uncovered women, unescorted women and especially infidel women, non-Muslims, are fair game for sexual assaults. Which culture will win here? Europe's culture of tolerance and pluralism and the separation of mosque and state and the progressive values of women's rights and gay rights or Sharia law values of fundamentalist Islam? Well, the answer is obvious. Who's got the numbers? If Muslims are a few percent of a population, local law will rule by sheer inertia. But what happens in a city like Malmo, Sweden, that's nearly 50% Muslim with large neighborhoods like this that are 90% Muslim. Well, remember this young man who was actually born and raised in Sweden, but who believes in Sharia law, in God's law, Allah's law, who believes that, in all, that all of Malmo Muslims ought not to be able to drink, and all of Malmo's Muslim women should be covered. What's your name? My name is Ibrahim. And uh, you're born here in Sweden? I'm born here. Homosexuality, I don't like that. So I don't think that it should be so open. Do you think do you think the rules should be changed at least in Muslim areas like Rosengard? A little bit, yes. Like what kind of rules? Like like a hijab, not necessarily a niqab, but maybe a hijab? Hijab, yes. How about for gays? I mean, there's some parts of Europe where gays kiss in public and they hold hands in public. Should that be limited? How would you limit that? Like, would I don't know how that would be handled. Uh, you know, I don't like that. So, I think the, if they have some thing between each other, they should do that at home, not in open. Uh, to be in the Swedish army is no problem. You can be. But I don't think that you should uh, have a war against your own religion and your own country. To be drunk... Yeah, on alcohol. It's, on alcohol, it's it's uh, forbidden in Sharia. 
do you want democracy with, with people who make law or do you want a Sharia a country where you live by the rules of God? That is Sharia. I would choose, you would choose Sharia. Sharia, yes. Would you like Sweden to become a Sharia country? Uh, I would like, but now I don't have anything against that it is d democracy in, here in Sweden. But if you could choose, you would choose? Sharia, yes. That's what we saw in Sweden. We saw it in Germany too. We know it's the same throughout Europe. Europe used to mean something, Western civilization, the Enlightenment, liberal democracy. Now it doesn't. Now it's just a geographical place and a bank account issuing welfare checks at best. Remember this young man, an entrepreneurial young criminal who came to Sweden at 16 without his parents, but who has chosen a career as a drug dealer. Well, listen, some people would say that you're not being a very good Swede, that you're selling drugs and that you're not being a productive citizen. What would you say to them? So, yeah. <laughs> so there's ordinary street crime like him. There's terrorism at worst and increasingly so. But even when everything is peaceful on the surface, the slow, relentless Islamification of Europe, replacing Western values with Islamic values of the most extreme variety. I was shocked to hear from Mona Walter, a Somali immigrant to Sweden, that she was never taught to hate infidels or unbelievers when she was back home in Somalia. She was never pressured to wear a Muslim veil when she grew up in Somalia. But all that happened only once she went to a radical Muslim mosque in Sweden. What did the imam here in Sweden say to you? What advice or instruction? What was it, what was it like on a day-to-day -day basis? It was horrible. It was like um, you have to be careful for your children, you have to watch out for the kafirs. Uh, kafirs, that means infidel. Infidels, uh, non-Muslim, like the Swedish people. They are kafirs. And Is that the word they use in the mosque? Ka uh, yeah, kafirs or mushrikeen. The mushrikeen means the criminals. So is that it? Is Europe over? Should we all just plan one last trip to see the museums before they're obliterated, like the Islamic State destroying ancient artifacts in Iraq like they do? Should we visit the Eiffel Tower just one more time before it's blown up? How do you even fight back against conquerors who are your own residents, your own citizens, even born there? How do you dispatch an army to fight your enemies when the enemies are within? Uh, we met people in Europe who are trying to fight back. They felt to me like dissidents, because they are. You see, in Western Europe, at least, the establishment is uniformly pro-migrant. And by establishment, I mean the 4P professionals, as described by Daniel Pipes, the press, the politicians, the professors, and the police. Now, Eastern Europe is different in Hungary, in Poland, in places not yet worn down by decades of liberal political correctness, in places still sensitive to being conquered barely 20, 25 years ago by the Soviet Union. They still defend themselves with vigor, but in Western Europe, the ruling elites are unanimous. This Muslim crusade throughout Europe will not be stopped. It's deep, it's psychological, I think it's pathological. Here, look at Angela Merkel, the German chancellor who threw open the borders and made the call to the world's Muslims to come in. Look at her being handed a German flag and throwing it away with disgust. That's not the Nazi flag, that is the modern flag of liberal democratic Germany. She hates that flag, she's embarrassed and ashamed to even hold it. She wants to replace the German people and she's doing it. And so the same is happening throughout Western Europe. Well, after the break, we'll show you people who think that's nuts. That's just insane to help you hate yourself so much that you will take anyone in at all, even people who are violent, even people who want to change your own culture and replace modernity and enlightenment with medieval style Sharia values. That's next. Want to have dinner with Faith Goldie? Grab a drink with Brian Lilly. Talk politics with Ezra. You can do it all on the Rebel Cruise. This November, join us for great debates, gourmet meals, and gorgeous scenery as we sail from Fort Lauderdale around beautiful Caribbean islands. 
It's an intimate week where you can really get to know your favorite Rebel personalities and meet other Rebel lovers too. Space is limited, so visit therebelcruise.ca to sign up now. I love Alberta. I've lived here my whole life and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our free market, pro-business, low-tax, do-it-yourself attitude. And now, I'm watching my province get destroyed. We've all had hints of the NDP's radical views in the past, but no one actually thought they'd ever run this province. Not even them. And now they are. And the worst is yet to come. I give my sad forecast for Alberta in my new ebook, The Destroyers. Rachel Notley and the NDP's War on Alberta. We went to Europe and we found some people who want to keep the Western values that the rest of the continent is abandoning out of fear of being called racist. We met a psychologist in Copenhagen, the Danish psychologist Nikolai Senels, who has had over a hundred Muslim patients and has made research into Muslim and jihadist psychology a field of his study. Here, have a listen. Well, you could say that there are four certain psychological traits uh, that are in general that gen are generally uh, nurtured in uh, Islamic or Muslim culture and they con uh, those four psychological factors you could call them they concern anger self, uh, self responsibility self confidence and tolerance and that's the four factors you would like to work with if you would like to uh, de-radicalize a Muslim or integrate a Muslim into our Western society my experience from having uh, yeah, more than 100 Muslim clients in, in, uh, as a psychologist is that there's a very, uh, let's say, unlucky combination between the, the psychological factors and the religion, and they play uh, very well together in a, uh, let's say, negative way. That was Nikolai Senels, a Danish psychologist. I think there's a lot more to be said and done in this field. We have seen this in Canada, the deadly mixture of honor and shame in radical Islam as it applies to young Muslim women who want to be free, who want to be Canadian, not live in a bag covered from head to toe like their medieval parents insist. What is the psychology that makes a father and a brother kill their own daughter and sister, as was done to Axa Parvez, the Muslim girl who wanted to live like she was in Mississauga, not in Pakistan. Is there something actually psychologically unhealthy in Sharia law and their approach to women? Well, even to dare to ask that question is to be too politically incorrect for 99% of psychologists, don't you think? But that's a big problem here. In the West, we know from centuries of experience, much of it hard fought, that it is our right to be skeptical of any philosophy or ideology or doctrine, including any religion. We show respect towards religion out of choice. We are grateful to religion because it helps shape our Western civilization and all of its benefits from art and music to charity and law. But we have the right to be scorching in our criticism of religion, but increasingly not so with Islam, which is not a race or an ethnicity, it is an ideology, just the same as Christianity is, except Islam has a decidedly more political element to it than Christianity has had in four or 500 years. But because Islam is inflexible and intolerant of criticism, it has lashed out against its critics in a way not seen in Christianity since perhaps the Spanish Inquisition, the whole of which had fewer casualties than a single spectacular Islamist attack in our age. But that's the grounds upon which Western police and prosecutors and judges censor critics of Islam. They equate criticizing Islam with hating individual Muslims and thus ban it all in the name of protecting the counterfeit human right not to be offended. Here, listen to Aya Fogg of the Free Press Society with whom we spoke in Copenhagen.
days, we have uh, a verdict just a few weeks ago where a man was uh, convicted of um, having uh, compared uh, Islam to Nazism. And uh, they, the, the court f uh, thought that um, it was, uh, he was not criticizing the religion Islam, but he was uh, criticizing Muslims. But, but well, criticizing is okay, uh, but not Muslims, and not because of your faith or your religion or your sexual conviction. What the court found was that criticizing a religion is the same as criticizing the followers of this religion, and that's new, because criticizing religion and ideologies is, is fundamental for a free society and for the, a democratic, uh, secular society. And that's, not, that's become a crime with this, uh, in this court's eye. Well, I think I most people prefer peace above liberty and freedom. So they want, they want just to, to live in peace and they think they can keep on living in peace by just appeasing um, Islam. We hope in the Free Press Society that we will regain our faith and in our cultural background and in being Danish and in Western values. And I think most people say that, that oh, we are now, but the fact is that we are giving it away slice by slice. In Copenhagen, we also spoke with Tanya Groff, a woman who has roots in Canada, but who is setting up a pro-Danish, pro-freedom NGO called Pegida. It's a peaceful group about the separation of mosque and state and about keeping liberal Western values. Listen to her. Our official media is not quite forthright and, and open about what is happening. And people aren't really bothering to, to put themselves into the situation. Well, why have you become an activist? You're not, you're not just for freedom. You're with a group, uh, Pegida. Yes. Uh, Denmark, I've heard a little bit about Pegida. I don't know that much about it. I... We did a report on Tommy Robinson and Pegida in the UK. What's Pegida all about here in Denmark? What does it stand for? Well, we stand we stand for uh, freedom of speech. We stand for um, for for freedom for women to actually uh, the separation of church and state, secular state, and separation of mosque and state too. And absolutely, separation of mosque and state. I ask an average Dane: do, do they know what they stand for? Do they do they believe in anything other than you know uh, a beautiful lifestyle and a gorgeous you know canal sidewalk? What what do people here believe in? Maybe they, maybe they figure that everybody has a right to that. Um, but they, they're not thinking far enough. They're not thinking about who's going to pay for this and what are the consequences. A culture is, is, is not something that is uh, it's interchangeable. You, we have a certain, every country has a culture, and we have to realize that other people that come to our country, they don't automatically become Danes. They don't have a little carry around a little It's Dane. not just a hotel. No. It, well, no. I, I bet every word you've just said in the last five minutes would be called racist by a European Union type, by a politically correct type. How is Pegida regarded by the establishment, the political media industrial complex here in Denmark? I suspect uh, as, as racists, uh, but even though we have, of course we are not racist, we don't care what color people are. Um, as long as people come here with the, right, uh, with, with the right attitude that they want to fit in, they want to assimilate, they want to work, they want to, to, to be Danish. What irony that Pegida has been described as fascist by their opponents. It's not, of course. In fact, I've never seen a group more concerned about being peaceful and being perceived as peaceful in my life. Tanya literally kicked someone out of a march once for even just giving the finger to screaming leftist protesters. That's how serious they are about being peaceful, almost pacifist. It's radical Islam and it's theocracy that's fascist, but funny enough, hard left-wing anti-fascists in Europe have decided to side with radical Islam. I don't quite get it, other than both of them want to undermine the West. The European anti-fascists don't realize that by allying with Islamic fascists, they will be devoured. Devoured last, but still devoured. Uh, we were in Denmark for several reasons, but one was because it was there that the Yillens Post, a newspaper, published the famous 12 cartoons of the Muslim prophet Muhammad back in 2005. That's more than 10 years ago now. Now, I reprinted those cartoons in the old magazine I published called The Western Standard, and that put me 
under the grindstone of Alberta's crazy Human Rights Commission for 900 days at the hands of Muslim extremist complainants. Hard to believe 10 years has gone by, and everything is worse now. Here's my interview with Danish journalist Mikhail Jalving, who works at the Jillens Poston. He tells me what it's like there today. Are they safe? Are they afraid of being the next Charlie Hebdo massacre target? Here's that interview. Well, you have to adopt yourself to the idea that the place might be bombed one day. But this goes with all media today. And this is, uh, of course, U.S. Post's most I infamous uh, paper in this country. But this goes uh, for any media that that uh, that uh, uh, digs up uh, stuff that might be uh, seem to be provocative or insulting or, or against the the ethos of Allah, whatever. I mean, you can never. Uh, be safe anymore. That's that's the, the rule of the game today. Half a year ago, they decided that they will not publish the cartoon, the Muhammad cartoon, again. They think they've they've done their job so far in that respect. And you're pointing to a a a, a new culture of. I mean, appearing to be courageous, appearing to care, appearing to to think that the uh, free speech is worth dying for, and the heart. I mean. Maybe it isn't. I mean, most, maybe most people prefer to live safe, bourgeois lives. Mikhail Jalving is a journalist, but like the others I spoke with, he felt on the edge, not in the center of Danish life. There are a lot of former liberals in Scandinavia who have been mugged by reality and are now being denounced as right-wingers, all for standing by their original liberal beliefs of equality for men and women, separation of mosque and state. Those used to be progressive values. Now they're out of fashion. Here's another journalist turned activist, our friend Ingrid Kalkvist, who is also our interpreter in Malmo, Sweden. Government's most important thing to do is to keep your own the people safe. That's that's why you are governing the country. But the Swedish government, they have been for, for many years now, you know, just they don't care about the Swedish people. They just want to, to change us out to people from, from the Middle East and from Africa and wherever. And we none of us can understand why they are doing this. People think that Swedes are not nationalistic, but they are. We are. We are. But we don't call it nationalism. Because, you know, Swedish people, they think that of course, we are the best country in the world. Who would ever doubt that? So everybody who comes to Sweden, they will, of course, understand that. In a, you know, in a, in a few years, they will understand that Sweden is the best country. We have the best rules, the best everything. So they would just want to be like us. And then they would integrate and assimilate and everything would be hunky-dory. And now the Swedes are, you know, seeing that they don't love us. They don't like Sweden. They don't want our system. They're just, you know, taking advantage of us. And now Swedish people are really sad about this. And they so, you know, they just woke up and said, what, what, this wasn't supposed to happen. You were supposed to love us and become just like us. Ingrid pulled together a dinner for us in Copenhagen. That's where we were interviewing her there. And many of the activists that we've shown you came together to meet us at that dinner. I felt like it was an underground sort of meeting, a bit stealthy, not for safety reasons, though now in retrospect, I think it was insane for us to gather like that in a public restaurant without armed security. In that room were half the anti-Islamization activists in Copenhagen and even half of Sweden. But it also felt underground in that no one there had real power. Those with power, the power to do things, were frozen with indecision, or more accurately, frozen in fear of being called politically incorrect, or the ultimate four-letter word in Scandinavia, being called racist. As if opposing a doctrine, an ideology like radical Islam, was like opposing a race that you should not criticize. Now, that was in Copenhagen, but it's even worse in Stockholm, Sweden. After the break, we'll tell you how a journalist and a politician are fighting back. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the Rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a fearless travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra Levant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to the rebel.media slash store to find out more.
Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. We flew next to Stockholm, the beautiful capital city of Sweden. Our guide for the day was Jan Sunnison, impeccably liberal. His parents were academics. He earned a PhD in sociology at the New School, perhaps the most left-wing educational institution in America. Left-wing, <laughs> they're communists there. He himself led the perfect liberal Swedish life. He married a woman from India. He taught at university. The liberal dream, the liberal lifestyle. But when he started speaking out against the threat to liberal values, the ideological threat posed by political Islam, he was no longer polite company. He was let go from the university. He was marginalized and punished for not complying with groupthink. It would be absurd to call him a racist or a fascist. It would just be too tough to debate him. So he was just pushed out of everything. He asks too many questions that Swedes don't want to think about. Swedes are famous for being neutral. They sat out the Second World War. They're good at ignoring problems and letting other people solve them. Trouble is, the problem is now in Sweden itself, and you can't be neutral or impartial about your own fate, can you? Here's Jan. Why are you worried about mass Muslim migration? What is it about your progressive mindset that made your alarms go off? The legal system? That you we Sharia law? Yeah, well, that, that we give in, that we're very soft on, on crime and soft on, on not keeping up our... our our, uh, the rule of law, for instance, in, in all these multicultural issues, there's a, there's a part where, where Sweden needs to stand its ground. So the legal part, the economic part, um, they're, they're, th these are the hard facts around immigration. Whereas the left and the progressives, they tend to all, always talk about the psychology, the, the culture part, the softer side, the ethnicity and religious. I mean, that's their playground. I have now got much much more into the legal processes around as asylum seekers and, of course, the economy. And if you look at that, the hard facts tell you that this is insane, admitting 163,000 people in one year. And at one point, it was 10,000 a week. If you take 10 times 52, it's 520 in a population of 9.5 million. That's, anyone can see that. So, um, so these, these ideas around psychology, whether you like people with different skin colors, that's just, that's just, the, that's their playground. And people they, are asylum seekers, they're not refugees. Refugees are defined during the Geneva Convention of 1951. Those are refugees. The so people are coming here are usually economic migrants. You can call them migrants, you call them asylum seekers, but you don't call them refugees, because then they give them states that they're not entitled to. I was in Stockholm there. It is a gorgeous city. It's what much of Europe would look like if the Second World War hadn't bombed it to ruins. So pretty. And a reminder of Sweden's passivity during that great conflict. I interviewed Stefan Ritter, a Swedish Jew, in front of the gorgeous old, centuries-old synagogue in Stockholm. Here, take a listen to this. They closed their borders for Jews, and they together with the Swiss, forced the Germans to mark the Jewish passports with the J. Swedes are so, they know Nazism uh, is connected to the Nordic German Aryan race. Oh. And Swedes belong to that. And Hitler and his gang, they were very much appreciative of the Swedes and Norwegians because they were the real Aryans. Now Ritter himself didn't have any kids. So many of the Swedes and Germans I met don't have any kids. They don't believe in the future. They don't have a stake in the future. Some of them don't care about the future. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, has no kids of her own. What does she care about Germany in 25 or 100 years? Germany now has the lowest birth rate in the world, lower even than Japan and Italy. But don't they see that importing millions 
of vigorous young Muslim men, well, yes, that's life and that's a future, but it's not the kind of life and future that Germany once had. The German government is now publishing a guide to having sex, just in case Germans had forgotten how to do it. Of course, it's targeted at migrants. Here's a helpful picture that's pretty accurately color-coded, too. If you bring in millions more Muslim men than you bring in Muslim women, who do you think the migrants will have sex with? And does anybody care about the future? Anyone in power, that is? Or is this mass Muslim migration just a giant continent-wide exercise in psychotherapy, working out issues from the Second World War, working out post-Christian issues of meaninglessness. I've never understood European pop culture and music, let alone deep postmodern philosophy. I'll just say I have no clue, but you'd think the country that gave us Freud would be able to figure itself out. Freud and a hundred other brilliant Western minds, scientists, philosophers, thinkers, artists, liberals, left-wing, right-wing, but all of them in the house of ideas, of skepticism and science and enlightenment, that's what's being lost in Europe. The enlightenment, the ability to criticize anything and everything, including the political doctrine of Islam, that's gone. And it's dragging everything else down with it. Let me leave you with two little acts of defiance. The first is a woman we met in Germany who heard that a Muslim imam was invited to a Christian cathedral to lead Muslim prayers in a great German Christian cathedral. Now, he wasn't sneaking in. He wasn't breaking in. He didn't buy an abandoned church, an empty church, as so many are. He was literally invited in by the church leaders and invited to say the Islamic call to prayer. Stop and think about it. And imagine for one-tenth of a second the likelihood that a Christian or a Jew would be invited to say a Christian or Jewish prayer in a Muslim mosque, let alone say the great mosque in Mecca. Infidels are not even allowed to enter that city. So this woman, Heidi, did what Martin Luther would do. She did something which is more than nothing. Of course, she was escorted out. She has no place in a German church now, but a Muslim imam leading an Islamic call to prayer, of course he does. He has a place of honor. But did you catch who she quoted there? She quoted Martin Luther. She told us why she felt compelled to quote him. Just in front of this church is a big monument of Martin Luther, very big, and um, they are just written, here I stand, I, cannot, I can do no other. And it means that uh, he had to stand up for truth, and I felt the same. I had to stand up for truth, and I still have to. Look, there are seeds of hope politically in Europe. I think the European Union is going to break up. It was wobbled for economic reasons, again, at Angela Merkel's insistence in her currency spat with Greece, the debt spat. It made no sense for those two countries, one very industrious, one more Mediterranean in its sense of leisure, to be under the same currency. What, I mean, that internal battle weakened the bonds of Europe, but Merkel's open borders is doing the rest. Eastern European countries are building fences and checking borders again against EU rules. They don't care. The rules are a laugh. The UK looks very much like it will leave the European Union before it's dragged under. They're not part of the euro currency. This is all about local control and keeping the latest Muslim mass migration from joining the last Muslim mass migration in the UK. Is it too late, though? It's not too late for us here in Canada Certainly not too late for the United States, but what can you do in a place like Sweden that has major cities that are now nearly 50% Muslim? Little Sharia enclaves that will never be liberal again. Well, we spoke to a member of the Swedish parliament, Kent Ekeroth. He's not a lone voice in Sweden, but he's in the opposition. His party, the Swedish Democrats, has as its central campaign platform restricting immigration. Imagine how bad it's got to be if an entire political party can be formed and built and rise to contender status simply on that one issue alone. Here, take a listen to him. In Sweden last year, we had 160,000, and that's a country of 9.7 million compared to 350 million in the US. You can see the differences. 
And these, this kind of immigration has affected us extremely negatively in, in all areas you can think of. Economics, uh, when it comes to crime, and culture, when Swedish people don't feel at home anymore in their own country. I think we need to stop immigration and I, I, we need I... to get people back to their own countries. How do we do that? Well, by making it less attractive to stay here and to give them money to go back. You know, cut in the welfare systems for non-citizens and further cutbacks for those who have already received a citizenship. If, you, if we don't adapt to you know, their way of life, building mosques, taking away uh, pork meat in schools or whatever it might be, make it less attractive for them to stay here, as well as making it more attractive for them to go back, I think we can achieve uh, some kind of a real change in that area. Smart guy, I think his party will form government one day, but will it be too late? After the break, is there any hope for Europe? My dire predictions next. so open-minded that the brains have fallen out. What's the point that you're making? The point that I'm making is that if you're going to propose a massive overhaul to the way the economy is, is developed in terms of carbon tax, cap and trade, other forms like that, it helps to have some science that is in fact settled. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian conservative news and opinion. Why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to the rebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on the Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out. Some Muslim migrants become great liberal democratic Europeans. Some do, I've met one or two. But many more become even more fundamentalist in their Islam than they were back in their home countries. They see Europe as a project, a colonial effort. They're settlers. The mirror image opposite of Rudyard Kipling's poem, White Man's Burden. That was the unofficial poem of the British Empire. Well, these Muslim migrants are the ground troops of a new Muslim empire, just ask them. They're not going to adopt secular Western law. They'll make Europe adopt Sharia Islamic law, bit by bit, informally at first, legally later. Do you doubt it? If you do, if you doubt it's possible, remember there used to be a great Christian city named Constantinople, once the largest and wealthiest city in Europe, once the seat of Christianity with a great cathedral called the Hagia Sophia. Now it's the great Muslim city of Istanbul, and the church, well, it was turned into a mosque. Now it's a museum. Egypt, that used to be a great Christian country too. Now it's Muslim with a tiny Coptic Christian minority. Do you think Europe today is somehow different or special, somehow immune to demographics and sheer willpower? I don't. In fact, I think Europe has never been morally weaker, never less sure of itself, never more undermined from within, never less aware of the nature of its conquerors. Constantinople didn't open up its gates to the Turks. It had to be besieged and attacked. Sweden, Germany, France today, they welcomed this. They invited it. Yeah. So go see the Eiffel Tower now before it gets the old World Trade Center treatment. Go see the great cathedrals of Cologne, Germany, and Notre Dame in Paris. Go see them now while they're churches. They'll be mosques like the Hagia Sophia soon enough. That's it for our show today. I hope you've enjoyed this special report, a series of seven episodes from our trip to Europe. From all of us here at The Rebel, keep fighting for freedom. Good night. Good night.